Chris Bourne hired me. Um, Isla McLeod mothered me through the whole process and away we went and very quickly um, Warren Main, who was the television critic down in the Christchurch area, was saying, I want to see who this voice is. Why can't we see this voice? Because um, we were doing everything. We were voiceovering and we were doing weather and news and so on, facelessly. They acceded. They put me on to close the night. Because television went to bed at 11 o'clock at night, remember. Uh, <laughs> this is long before the Goodnight Kiwi, by the way. <laughs> um, we'd get on there and say, on behalf of all of us at Television New Zealand, good night now. Well, I, I did. And um, he demanded to see what I looked like. So there I was doing this thing. And that worked. So maybe we'll get you to do the closing weather as well. Maybe we'll get you to do the closing news, weather, and good night. And so you're beginning to get a continuity package. And then maybe we'll think about putting you on at 7 o'clock at night just after the news so that you can set up the whole evening. So we did. And it took off. I had been lucky enough to work in Western Australia with some very professional people, um, one of whom was Trina, and she was the weather girl, and she winked. And I thought, yes, that, I'd like that. It was, it's such a silly gesture, isn't it? You know? <laughs> so I came on and started winking and blinking and carrying on. And I do load my scripts with lots of innuendo and all kinds of, I suppose, cheeky um, approach to, to it all. Whimsical, I hope. Um, and it all just started a snowball that just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, so for s well, five years, from 1975 to 1980, it just was <laughs> the craziest roller coaster I've ever been on. I don't think anybody else really experienced that. We used to do two shows a day um, because the program went out on a Monday and a Friday evening. And we would do those just back to back, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, as live. And this was an era of local artists who were doing covers of the international hits. We were still just a wee way away from Bohemian Rhapsody turning up, um, because then the era of the video clip was off and running around that same time. But for the first few months of 1975, anyway, we were doing it all ourselves. Boom, along come these, the beginnings of what now is a massive industry. But in those days, it was a one-off treat that we had this brand new clip from overseas. <laughs> in that midnight to dawn slot on telethon, traditionally, it dies off. And so you're working extra hard to keep enthusiasm going. I mean, it really is hard work. Um, so two people who come in and just are larger than life and are roaring like bulls and, and doing the most ridiculous things for just a few dollars uh, was, was something that had never been seen before. Um, and it made everybody sit up. Again, Warren Main wrote, Thank God for Roger and Stu, because it was dying, a death. And we came in and just took it by the scruff of the neck and ran with it. Um, it did some outrageous stuff, you know, we really did. And of course, everyone's waiting for the pie in the face, because we'd choreographed it. And um, which is, it's no secret, is it? I mean, Telethon actually, while it looks hugely spontaneous, is actually a reasonably choreographed run of events um, with some spectacular surprises <laughs> on the way. But essentially, it's, it's going to a master plan, yeah? Um, well, we sort of wrecked that master plan for about three or four hours one morning. It was great fun. It is the most astonishing thing to give your heart and soul for 24 hours and about six hours later walk into the studio and there is nothing there. It's all gone. It's been demounted and broken down and shipped away and there's one deflated balloon left over in the corner sort of thing and, and you go, 
did it even happen? You know, it's that, that real transient thing about television is it, it's there tonight, it's gone tomorrow. Um, and it, it's out, it's published, it's gone. And in my case, most of the stuff that I did probably doesn't exist now except, you know, on a, on a radio wave or a TV wave heading for Andromeda sort of thing, because a lot of it was taped over. Um, you know, the archiving back in the day wasn't spectacularly good. It had to be taped over. I was wearing a radio microphone, which was probably about ten, twelve thousand dollars worth in those days, um, and was vital to the production. We go out onto a trampoline, and we're standing right beside a swimming pool, and we're bouncing up and down, and I'm holding the microphone way over here, and I said, "Push me," and he goes, "What?" <laughs> push me, and so he did, and I went into the pool, microphone and all. You could hear Ken Sedell screaming from the outside broadcast van, you know, right across the park in Whangarei. <laughs> Oops. In Christchurch, all we had to do was get off the car and run under the park at QE2 there, right? The distance is maybe 30 feet. We nearly didn't make it. Um, I'd said, you'll need more police there to keep the crowd back. And they sort of looked at me like television wanker, you know, come on, there's six policemen, that'll be more than enough. Those cops just disappeared under a ton of children. <laughs> and the kids were get, getting at Stu in particular. They wanted a piece of his hair or a piece of his clothes. And um, Roger's white suit wouldn't be bad either, you know. And so. <laughs> So we, we barely made it in, um, intact. And, and you sort of go, whoa, something very, very strange just happened here. Um, kind of cool on reflection. But at the time, man, nasty feeling. And it got more intense as we traveled through New Zealand. So by the time we got to Whangarei and I wrecked that microphone, um, it, it was a just insane tour for us. We would literally fly into the town, do our business, get on the plane and get out, you know. 75 through 80 was a wonderful period, but it was coming to an end and you'd have to be blind not to see what was coming, so you better reinvent yourself. Um, and, and so I lobbied uh, David Bordock and Diane Gilliam Knight really hard to be one of the presenters, or the presenter, Turned out that it was going to be um, Bill Manson and Roger Gascoigne. Um, and we were the Wellington component of the new era of regional programs. Um, so I was going to have to go through a bit of a transition from being <laughs> Winkin' Blinken <laughs> to um, a news presenter. A transition I actually did find quite difficult, I will say. Um, but the illusion fortunately for a lot of people, was that I'd been there for the entire decade of the 80s. I wasn't. I left in 1982 and I came back in about 1987, 8, somewhere around there. Yeah. Mark Leishman did it. Mike Bodner did it. But for some reason, people thought I was there for the entire decade. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. I would dearly have loved to have had a career in acting as well, but apparently my brand is too strong or something. Um, but every now and again, I'm hauled out to play something approaching Roger Gascoigne, which in the case of Chip Champion was, <laughs> was a cross between Peter Sinclair and me, um, who was just one of those <laughs> yay! <laughs> you know, presenters for a pop show. So that, that was my involvement with Peppermint Twist. Yeah. And you enjoyed it? I loved it. Well, how, how hard could it be to be something vaguely approaching what you were? Again, you think back to, to your actual involvement with something like Peppermint Twist. Um, Peppermint Twist was, was take one, that's it. And you go, hang on, I think I could do that better. No, nah, it's too late, we're gone, we're, you know, we're under pressure. Next. Again, here comes the end of the 80s and 
the summer before, they'd trialled this thing called Homes, and you knew, you just knew that um, the four regionals were going to be amalgamated into the program that became Homes. And so at the end of the 80s, um, it was coming at you like a runaway train. If you couldn't see it, you were a very... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> limited intelligence, shall we say. Um, if, if you couldn't see it, um, you were in trouble. So do you, again, make the move to Auckland and pursue that career aggressively, or do you just go, Pfft. turns out, I mean, I read about the fact that the regional programs have been dropped in the New Zealand Herald. I didn't get a phone call saying, by the way, it's over. Um, you go, oh. <laughs> But, I mean, I, I, I realised that was the case. Um, so, Barbara and I had a beautiful lifestyle here, on the water, bringing up kids in schools that we liked. To do that in Auckland, what? Quarter, half a million dollar mortgage? I didn't want that nonsense. I already had um, the lifestyle that I'd worked quite hard to get. Um, so. For me, Auckland wasn't particularly um, an option, really. So, OK, let's go and see what else is there in the world. Uh, surprisingly, there's a whole world outside of television. Wow, who knew? <laughs>